Um, good morning and welcome to the 16th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could everybody switch off their electronic devices or at least switch them to silent mode so it doesn't interfere with the committee's work? Um, before I move to today's business, I should of course mention that our former colleague, Ross Thompson, has resigned from the committee following his election as an MP. Um, I would like to place on record our thanks to Ross for his contribution to the committee um, and wish him well for the future. Um, item one on the agenda invites us to take items four and five in private. Is that agreed? Great, thank you very much. Item two, and we now move um, to further consideration of the report by the National Audit Office entitled Administration of the Scottish Income Rate of Income Tax 2015-16. And in March, we heard from the National Audit Office and the Auditor General for Scotland on this report and agreed to take evidence from HMRC. So I very much welcome to the meeting Jim Harra and Sarah Walker, both from HMRC. Um, as there's no opening statement, I will move us straight to questions and ask Colin Beatty to start off. Thank you, Convener. Um, in previous uh, uh, sessions, I've asked pretty much the same question. It's about identification of the, the Scottish taxpayers. Um, I believe that there's no definitive record or data set uh, of Scottish residents against which to test your success mm. in uh, identifying Scottish taxpayers. And in previous evidence sessions, we've been advised We've, we've tried to pin down, is, the, is, is there an error margin of 5%, 10%, and nobody's able to give us that. What sort of reassurance can you give us that you've actually managed to identify all the taxpayers? I mean, I think, um, I think we've, we've got three tasks, really. I mean, first of all, we have to make sure that uh, everyone who's got a uh, a Scottish address on our databases is properly flagged as a Scottish taxpayer. Then we've got to uh, check the accuracy of our database and make that as accurate and up to date as we possibly can. And then we've got an ongoing job of maintaining uh, that and continuously improving on it uh, all the time. We've taken a number of uh, steps to check our database against other third party databases. Uh, we have uh, looked at where there is a difference between those to see if there's anything that we can learn about our database uh, management. Uh, in the case of Scottish database, uh, Scottish uh, addresses on our database, we have uh, run corroboration exercises with a number of third party databases, the electoral role, uh, credit reference agencies, major retailers, for example, and we've been able to corroborate between 98 and 99 per cent of those addresses that we hold that they, they are uh, uh, corroborated. For the for the difference, the remaining 1% to 2%, that doesn't mean they're wrong, it just means they're not corroborated by anyone else. We've also been able to take some reassurance that our processes for keeping our database up to date mean that it actually stands up to scrutiny compared to those others. And in fact, uh, where we saw discrepancies between ours and the electoral roll, in the majority of cases, ours was the more up-to-date and accurate uh, record. Uh, but you're right, it's a, it's a question of continuously improving, but there is no definitive benchmark against which we can judge to say whether we are at 100% or 99% uh, completeness of our database. It seems that mostly you're relying on postcodes. How, how accurate is that? Well, we, uh, we have a set of parameters that identify Scottish addresses on our database. We did uh, initially uh, rely too much, I think, on uh, postcodes and the postcode, what we call the PAF, the postcode authentication uh, Field and uh, but we have since extended that scan and we pick up uh, addresses in lots of different formats. We've also carried out uh, an exercise to identify addresses on our database that are incomplete, for example, don't contain a full uh, postcode, and we've done a cleansing exercise to uh, bring that uh, up to date. There are also a small number of uh, postcodes that straddle the English Scottish border and therefore you cannot rely on the postcode alone uh, to determine who is a Scottish taxpayer and in those cases we've taken further steps to identify which addresses within the postcode uh, need to be flagged as Scottish addresses. Now you mentioned uh, checking against third party databases and you mentioned the uh, electoral register for one. Um, can you just remind me what the other databases are that you're checking against? I mean, I'll let Sarah give you some details. If you want. Um, 
We used a commercial uh, firm who specialises in this sort of thing. They have a number of uh, address uh, address lists. They have, as, as I say, uh, commercial uh, credit agencies, uh, places where you are registered to have deliveries from for mail order uh, for mail order companies, um, uh, mobile phone and. Uh, other sort of commercial providers where you have to provide an address and they uh, make their address lists available to these sort of commercial companies which are, are then available to compare with our lists. So if you've got the name, if you can identify somebody by name and address and then you can see if they are, the same name and address appears on, on, on other lists. So every time we order something on mail order, you guys are checking on that? No, I don't think that's my, that's not what I say, and, I, and these are, are um, commercially available companies. This is we, we don't get all that information ourselves. We ask so somebody else to do So you purchase that information in. Yeah. But you are right. I mean, your footprint with retailers and mobile phone companies and utilities is is actually building a a record uh, in databases, which these commercial organisations all share, and we do use that to uh, verify and validate uh, our database. We don't just. Uh, tech addresses from those because you know where our uh, record does not corroborate with that it doesn't mean that theirs is more accurate than ours but it does mean that that's something for us to investigate now obviously that's an ongoing process how often do you go through it or is it one big exercise every year or is it an ongoing thing we're talking to the Scottish Government now about exactly how regularly we should do that comparison I think we're expecting it to be every year it is quite a major exercise and takes a, it costs money and it takes time to do. So I don't think we would do it more, more often than that. I was just about to come to the cost. Um, is that included in the, what you're already charging the Scottish Government? Yes, yes. So it's not an additional cost? No, it's not an, not an additional cost. Now, I understand that 80,000 um, employers had problems with tax codes and that it's now fixed. How was it fixed and what was the real problem? I think... Um, so as well as identifying uh, people as Scottish taxpayers, we then have to uh, require employ employers to deduct the correct amount of tax from them. Uh, and this year, 2017-18, for the first time, that is a different amount of tax than in the rest of the UK. So we send a coding notice to both the employer and the employee, telling them what code to apply to make sure the correct amount of tax is uh, is deducted. We then have a programme of employer compliance checks to make sure that employers are complying with their payroll and obligations and are uh, applying those codes correctly in their payrolls and, and deducting the correct amount of tax. You know what what we find when we go out on, on employer compliance visits is that there is actually a very high level of compliance. It's, it's the lowest tax gap really out of all the uh, the taxes that we administer. But there are problems. Sometimes employers make errors. And in the case of the Scottish Code, we have found that in some cases, the software programs that they are using have not been updated to take account of the what we call the S codes, the Scottish Taxpayer Codes. Um, so we have taken action both with the employers where we find that they're making errors and with the software providers to make sure that they've got the correct specification and update their products for their customers. How widespread the, is that error? It's you know, it, it was, it's been very small in percentage terms, but it is there. If I can just explain what the impact of it would be, we then run a reconciliation exercise at the end of the year for each employee. So at that point, we would pick up if there has been an under-deduction of tax, and we would correct it at that point. So there would be no impact on the Scottish Government's uh, finances, but it would be undesirable from the taxpayer's point of view because they would uh, find at the end of the tax year that they have an underpayment when ideally that would have been taken out of their salary as they went through the year. So despite the fact that we have that sort of fail-safe reconciliation at the end of the year, the ideal is that this is operated correctly during the year. But we have got very high compliance rates and you know, we're, we're continuously improving on that. I think the key is to make sure that software providers keep their products up to date and that employers use the latest version of those software products. Thank you very much, Colin. Monica Lynn. Thanks, convener. Um, I'm interested in the, the situation you know, whereby 420,000 taxpayers didn't receive information that 2.45 million taxpayers did receive. And the, to take you back to the comments made by the Comptroller and Auditor General in his report, he said that that may have created a less informed group of taxpayers. I just wonder, first of all, is that a concern that you recognise? And 
and do you think that's well founded? I mean, I think I think it is a possible concern. They first of all, the four hundred twenty thousand uh, Scottish taxpayers who were not picked up in the initial scan did receive a written communication, they, but they did receive a different communication from the other two point four million people. So we sent out letters to 2.4 million people in December 2015. Uh, the other 420,000 received uh, a, a page encoding notice in early 1617, which specified on it, you have been identified as a Scottish taxpayer. And that is our standard means of communicating with people in Peugeot and about the code that we are applying. So everyone did receive a communication, but obviously it was a different communication for the two population sets. Uh, you know, we have not seen any evidence that it has a practical uh, impact on the uh, on the taxpayers, uh, but obviously it's you know it there is a they did receive a different communication. Okay, um, I'm interested. I mean, communication is clearly important here, so I'm just interested to hear more about what your wider communication strategy is mm -hmm. um, and what the cost of that is. Yeah, so we we think that uh, good communications are key to uh, maintaining the accuracy of our address database and uh, continuously improving on that. So continuously reminding uh, taxpayers, employers and tax agents of the need to notify us of changes uh, in address is what we th is the key compliance activity that we think will, will make a difference. Uh, there obviously was an initial uh, uh, communication exercise which involved some unpaid and paid uh, communication uh, and that uh, continues. Uh, so, for example, we use our regular contacts uh, with taxpayers and employers to remind them of the need to update their addresses. We used Twitter just two days ago. Uh, we tweeted all our followers on Twitter of the need to keep their uh, addresses uh, up to date. Sometimes that is specific about Scottish uh, addresses, but sometimes it is a general message to all taxpayers. So, you know, the administration of the Scottish income tax benefits from that, but also the, the all administration benefits from it. Um, I think the, there's lots of communication we can do that does not involve additional cost and is effective. I think a question is how much money would the Scottish Government wish to spend on paid communication and what advice could we give them about what additional benefit they might get from that. Most of the paid communication that we used in the early stages was targeted at specific groups of uh, Scottish taxpayers that we thought we needed to reach to make sure that they heard the message about keeping addresses up to date. So, for example, people who lived in borders uh, areas, uh, it may not be good value for money to do it much more widespread than that. Okay, you mentioned Twitter, which mm -hmm. can be a very cost-effective way of getting your message out. I wonder how many followers um, HMRC has on Twitter, and are you using Facebook and other yes, social we do. media channels? I think, we've, I think we have 28,000 followers on uh, Twitter. Many of those are professional associations and tax agents who then spread the message more uh, more widely. Uh, but we, yes, we do also use other social media. Okay. Um, and what assessment has been undertaken to ensure that the communication strategy and the costs incurred um, are providing value for money? Yeah, do you want to? Um, yeah, we, d we did a, a, an evaluation of the publicity we, we, we conducted at the time of the uh, launch of the Scottish Rate, so at the time we were sending out the letters. Um, they That um, suggested that there was a significant proportion of, the, of targeted groups, which is recent, people who've recently moved, people who live in the borders, and students were uh, were aware of the campaign. So around about four, 30 to 40 percent of the, that that target population were aware of the campaign that we'd conducted. Um, there was a an increase in the number of people who were uh, going to our website and, the, and and updating their address details on our website. Uh, so we think that that uh, that campaign was effective at the time. What we're doing now is continuing to use these unpaid, uh, sort of cost-free uh, uh, methods like Twitter and like our contacts with employers and with agents. We're also talking now with the Scottish Government about whether we should be doing more targeted communications to, to pick up people who move house. Because if we've got a, a fairly good confidence of the static population that we are at the, that w when we started, we need to make sure that we are getting the changes so the people who move into and out of Scotland 
and we're thinking of looking at things like um, using the data we get from uh, stamp duty and uh, land registry work where people are registering uh, the purchase of a property to, to prompt people to say if you've just moved into Scotland or just moved out of Scotland, remember you have to uh, tell HMRC um, and estate agents and people like that. Um, so we are looking at what the most cost-effective way of picking that up. We're also using uh, our own digital services, the personal tax account, where we, we are uh, conducting publicity to encourage people to sign up for a personal tax account online where they can manage all their tax affairs, and that includes making sure they're aware of what address we hold for them and, and making it easy for them to update it. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Well, I'm sure our witnesses are already following our committee on Twitter, but I'm sure <laughs> our colleagues here will endeavour to, to follow you back uh, by the end of the session. <laughs> Thanks, convener. I don't think I've ever knowingly wanted to follow HMRC <laughs> on Twitter, but forgive me for that. <laughs> Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, convener. Uh, good morning to you. Um, isn't it a wee bit disconcerting for the public to hear that HMRC is relying to some degree on mail order companies and mobile phone companies to compile a definitive list of taxpayers? I think that's, that, that's not what we're doing, and I'm glad I've got an opportunity to clarify that. So, you know, we regard ourselves as holding the database of who is uh, paying tax, uh, but, uh, you know, it is important that we check the accuracy of what we have against all other available sources and uh, maintain its quality and learn and take action if any sort of corroborative evidence tells us that we've got a problem. So it is just a source of uh, information that helps us to check what we've got. It's not, but we're not reliant on it to uh, maintain the database. I should say that we, in no case have we taken an address from that sort of a database and, and, over, uh, and replaced it our own address with that address. So we, the, the addresses that we hold, which we get primarily from the taxpayer themselves and sometimes from employers, are always our primary source. The comparison with the, the commercial databases is simply to, to raise a query, if you like. If, we've got a, if they've got a different address, we can then assess whether we need to query that and whether we ought to be making more inquiries, but we wouldn't take the commercial address in preference to the, the address that we hold. And indeed, one of the outcomes of the exercise that we've done is, you know, we have not found a database that we would wish to overwrite ours because in many cases, uh, you know, our, ours proves in the majority of cases to be more accurate than the and more up to date than the databases that we're comparing with. Mm -hmm. So, so there are no cases where data that you perhaps got from mail order companies or mobile phone companies that gave you additional information to corroborate a Scottish taxpayer. You had it anyway. Uh, yes, yeah, so so we, you know, what what we did was, you know, we've got an address for this person. Evidence on these other databases tend to corroborate the address that we have, or do they ra cause us to raise a query about the address that we have, or do they not tell us anything at all and it's basically uncorroborated and we've got no evidence either way? Where they tend to corroborate what we have, then we regard that as, as some evidence that our database is, uh, has good quality. Where they uh, say something different from our database, then as Sarah says, that raises uh, a query on our part to go back to, for example, the taxpayer and check uh, just where exactly are you living. Uh, where they don't corroborate either way, and there were a significant proportion of them where you know, there was no corroboration, we then looked at other factors uh, to assess that. So, for example, uh, if you had someone and, you know, we have an address for them, these other databases don't show uh, anything at all for them, but they're shown, a, you know, we know they're employed by a chip shop in Aberdeen, then, you know, the chances are they're Scottish, they're Scottish taxpayer and our Scottish address for them is, is correct. Um, so, so, yes, we do learn from them, that's why we spend the money on the exercise, but, uh, you know, they have tended uh, to corroborate our, our Scottish addresses, as we said, between 98 and 99 percent of those have been corroborated by that exercise, and we have yet to identify the database that where we think, oh, that's a much better database than than ours. How did you resolve uh, those addresses that had partial postcodes? You mentioned partial postcodes in some of the data. How did you resolve that? We work with the Royal Mail in those cases, and we have teams of people who will go through individual addresses 
uh, to work with Royal Mail to try and make sure that we can, you know, if we've got a, ro an, a, ro a road and a house number, we'll work with Royal Mail to make sure that we can then make sure we've got the right postcode on the record. Mm. Could, could I ask, why would that not have been done as a matter of course to, to make sure that the data that you have is always correct? It only seems to have arisen because of this requirement to identify separate Scottish tax. It, it is a continuous process. We do do, the, do that work um, year by year to make sure that we're keeping our address. But it, we have millions and millions of addresses. It's a constant process. And this is the first time that your address has actually made a, a, an, abs a, an actual effect on your tax. It makes it even more important that these addresses are up to date. So we put extra effort into making sure that the Scottish addresses were corrected. What's to stop the problem continuing if people move around as they generally do, and particularly cross-border addresses? What's to stop these anomalies continuing to be part of the system? I think it, I think it is a, a never-ending task to maintain and improve the quality. Um, it's not it's not a static one-off exercise. Uh, you know, we have assessed that there are about eighty thousand moves a year across the England-Scotland border, it, roughly half in each direction. So if we did nothing and didn't update our databases, then they would degrade uh, over time. Uh, so, it, so it is a continuous exercise. We do obviously get a continuous flow of data. So for example, taxpayers contact us all the time to tell us they've moved house. Employers contact us all the time to say we've taken on a new employee and this is their uh, uh, address. And you know we periodically run those corroboration exercises against the commercially available databases, which throw up uh, cases for us to query. So uh, you know it will be a never-ending process. And lastly, in, in the data set that you have, is, it, is the solution to this not as simple as allowing people to identify themselves the country they live in? That's exactly what we want people to do. That's Are you exactly doing what that? We're yes, we, 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 we expect people, we rely on people to give, it, give, give us their address. Yes, and I know that's that, how the country that they live in, Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland. Um, do you ask people to give you that information? For self-assessment, we will. Where, where people are filling in a tax return, there will be a specific, you know, are you a Scottish taxpayer? But I think we, we need to have people's addresses for all sorts of purposes, and that's our main... That's our main source of information for this. And I think if they're prepared to tell us that they're a Scottish taxpayer, they ought to be prepared to tell us their address because we need it anyway. Yes, yes I know that. I understand what you're asking there, but that's not what I'm asking. Are you asking people to, to give their country that they live in? They may be a Scottish taxpayer, or they may think they're not a Scottish taxpayer, but do they live in Scotland or England? Or do you ask them that information so you can record it? Because you were talking about S codes, I think that's for what for self assessment. I mean, I think it's um, uh, it's important to understand that there are only about nine million taxpayers in the whole of the UK who have to complete a self assessment return, uh, and therefore, you know, are under an obligation to tell us that information, and they will be asked for that on their self assessment return. The vast majority of uh, taxpayers, their affairs are administered between HMRC and their employer, and there is no obligation for them to get in touch. Uh, with us, uh, and therefore we have to look for data that they that that we can get that tells us where they live, and the address obviously is the is the key thing. So we we haven't gone down a route of asking all taxpayers to declare that the country in which they live for tax purposes. We've asked we've asked them to keep us up to date with the address where they live, and then we will apply that to determining their taxpayer status. Uh, if for any reason people feel that that comes out with the wrong answer for them, they have of course the right to uh, either update the data if they think the data is wrong, or if the data is right but they don't think they pass the tests to, to challenge that. Yeah. Would it not be easier just to ask them the country they live in and gather that data? Uh, in my view, I mean, there, there, is a, there is a test for determining whether someone is a Scottish taxpayer and it applies over the whole of the tax year, so it's, yeah. it's a slightly complex thing actually to ask some people, particularly if they're mobile. Uh, you know, I think we feel that if we know the address where you live, that's going to, you know, that's, that's going to enable us to determine it uh, accurately. But, but the test that you applied so far missed 420,000 of them. 
Yes, I mean that was uh, so we, we there was an error in our original scan. So while we had a Scottish address on our database for those people, the per, sort of technical parameters of the of the scan of the computer did not pick those addresses uh, up, and that was an unfortunate error for which uh, you know I am very sorry. Uh, it was, I'm glad to say, identified uh, and fixed uh, very quickly, but it does not. Uh, it does not go to the sort of accuracy of our data about where people live. It, it went to the, the sort of accuracy of that one-off job of running the scan against our system. So. If you don't mind me just pressing, but what does it mean when you say running the scan and the scan didn't pick up the fact yeah. that we're Scottish? Do you mean it missed a field where there should have been a postcode or it was in the wrong field or it was a partial postcode? Yes, yeah, so the... It so didn't the, have a country name, or, you know... Mm -hmm. So the, the, the technical parameters, so, so obviously we had all that address data on our systems, but we had not in the past flagged people as Scottish taxpayers because there had been no, no, you know, no, no there'd been nothing in the tax system to, to, that would have required us to do that. So when the Scottish rate of income tax came in, we had to identify all of those addresses that we held on our database and flag that record as a Scottish taxpayer record. So there was, a, there was a sort of technical specification of the scan that ran across our whole address database to pick that up. Uh, and some of the sort of parameters of that scan did not pick up some of the input methods that had been used for our addresses. In particular, it did rely, over rely on postcodes and the way in which the address had been inputted from postcode. And in fact, there are other means by which addresses can be input, which that initial scan did not pick up. So two things should have happened. First of all, you know, the people who designed the scan should have had a deeper understanding of how addresses are input to our system and got the scan uh, right. Uh, you know, secondly, there should have been more testing of the scan to identify the results of the scan to identify the error. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, that mistake got through. Uh, and, you know, when it was picked up, we did fix it. But I think, you know, if I was doing that exercise again, uh, which we will be doing for uh, Wales shortly, uh, you know there are lessons to be learned from that to get the quality of that and the testing of it better. Right, just to show, is it, is it not the solution to just simply have the word Scotland or Wales or England in a column in the data attached to every address, then you won't miss any? Um, I think... If the software works, that is. I think, I mean, at the, certainly at the, at the moment, you know, until now, because the country in the UK where you live has not been relevant to your tax affairs, that's not a field that we've required people to capture, with the exception of some postcodes that straddle, the, a small number of postcodes, I think it's about six that straddle the border, the postcode does tell you which country the address uh, is in, and the postcode is what we've always had on our uh, address list, because that's what's relevant for mailing. So, you know, I think we feel that that's... Uh, the best way from the data that we have of identifying Scottish taxpayers. You know, I think with hindsight, if you had known when we were starting to collect addresses from people 30, 40, 50 years ago, that there might have been a differential, you might have asked people for the country, but that's not where we are. And I don't think it's necessary to do it in order to get at the, the identification that we need because the address data and the, the postcode data pretty much do it. So there'll be no errors next time round. Uh, I, hope there I hope when I'm sitting before the equivalent of the, uh, uh, in Wales that, that I'll be able to say there weren't. Uh, certainly, I think we've, we've learned lessons from that exercise, which unfortunately I think Scotland won't gain from because it was a one-off exercise, but Wales will. But we've also learned lessons about the ongoing need for assurance, which I think probably have strengthened our, uh, our assurance activity that you will benefit from on an ongoing basis. Okay, thank you. Okay, Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, the... Costs of implementing the Scottish income tax powers mm -hmm. keep reducing, the estimate, uh, which on one analysis sounds quite good. But first of all, how can five million, I think, is the latest saving that's being made? How can five million be saved, briefly? Um, I think the story of this is um, that uh, we've been... The, the initial uh, estimate, which was, I think, 40 million, was given back in 2010. So it was uh, real, really a long way ahead of implementation. Um, we were doing a lot of new things that we'd never done before. Um, and I think we were cautious in the estimates that we gave. Um, over time, there have been a number of things that, 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 have, uh, that have happened. We've been able to have a better idea of how to do the IT changes. The cost of the IT changes have come down. 
But I think the big, the big reason that the estimates have come down is that we thought there would be a lot more cost of contact with the, with the public, a lot more cost of um, the mail shot that we did, a lot more um, actual staff costs and operational costs in our, in our business where we would have to deal with changes and correspondence. As it happens, because we've had good time to plan for it, we managed our communications, we did the work at the, at the level of the database to check our, uh, our addresses. Uh, we didn't need to do so much contact with customers. And we have had, a, uh, I think, quite a lot less um, contact and, and, and queries from them that we thought we would have to deal with. So I think a lot of the, a lot of the cost reduction is on um, less contact with the, with the public, less um, administrative work that we thought we might have to do. Um, the recent reduction, um, again, is less uh, is again largely less administrative and operational work. Um, I think we've also got a clearer idea of the IT requirements for working with the pensions relief at source um, schemes, where we've had to put up put in a separate um, system to make sure that pension schemes who are claiming relief at the basic rate from HMRC are able to identify Scottish taxpayers so that if the basic rate is different, they will, change, they will claim a different amount of relief for that. So that, that work is, is still ongoing. That's the, that's the most recent, um, that, that's the, the sort of last big chunk of work we've got to do. So I mean, this committee often sees it going the other way. Yes. Um, so on, on one analysis, it's all quite encouraging. But of course, there, there is a concern in my mind that significant over-budgeting has consequences as well in terms of how one makes provision for that. Uh, so are you aware, uh, has the Scottish Government, in terms of its own funding, made provision anywhere for 40 million? Uh, in effect said, okay, we, we haven't got 40 million to play with, let's put it over here. Uh, and if so, what impact has that had on day-to-day -day running? Uh I can't comment on how the Scottish Government manages its budget. I mean, our, con our contact with the Scottish Government has mainly been, certainly we've been keeping them in touch with our reassessment of the costs, but we've also been doing, uh, working closely with them with the sort of short-term forecasting. So each year we've been um, giving them an estimate, which, which is uh, uh, the best estimate we can give them. Um, we've been, they've been involved in our uh, program governance, so they have the same access to cost forecasts as, as we do. They, they see all our program and project papers. Um, and uh, so I think they have as, as good an understanding as, as we have. I, I, I agree. Uh, I think the estimate of 40 million back in 2010 was pretty speculative. Um, I think it was done well before we had done um, a lot of work on it. I think we were asked to give an estimate, and we did, and we, 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 we erred on the side of caution because we thought this was, this, this was a big novel and um, uh, difficult, it was difficult to predict at the time. Hey, just moving slightly in the area, if, if there is an error, we've, we've looked at an error on the number of Scottish taxpayers. Uh, there is an impact on the tax take and there's a rectification cost. Uh, now, this time round, understanding HMRC have borne that cost, if there were to be a further error, there would be a rectification cost, but it, presumably there would be uh, or potential for um, rectification of the opportunity cost of not having taken all the tax that was uh, taken in. So is it reasonable to assume that HMRC would pick up that cost again, if there were to be a further error. Um, I think that's hypothetical. We do have we, we have in our memorandum of understanding with the Scottish government um, a presumption that they will bear all our costs for, of implementation, and that is um, following Treasury rules um, for public expenditure. Um, in the case of the error that led to the 420,000 uh, people being missed off the database, there wasn't an effect. There wasn't any effect on tax take there, because partly because it was rectified quickly, and also because obviously there was no difference between the Scottish tax rate and the English tax, the UK tax rate at the time. Um, 
but for that for that particular issue we did agree that we would bear the cost because it was clearly our error but i think we would want to look at future uh, future circumstances in, in the uh, according to the circumstances of the time. Uh, so just to be clear, if there were to be an error by HMRC in the future which had a cost, it is not, one couldn't automatically assume that HMRC would pick up the cost of rectification. Is that fair to say? I think, I think it is fair to say you can't automatically uh, assume that. Uh, you know, I would expect us to you know follow the approach that we followed um, uh, in this instance, in the instance of the four hundred and twenty thousand taxpayers, where you know we we would approach it ourselves in a reasonable uh, manner. Uh, you know that was clearly our mistake. We you know, we we took it on the chin financially ourselves. Um, but you know as as Sarah said, we'd have to look at each uh, instance. Hopefully there won't be any, but if there were, we'd have to look at them individually and assess you know what what we wanted to do, and we'd have to enter into a dialogue with the Scottish government, who I would. Uh, you know, I, who I can, I can pretty much understand where they would come from uh, in that debate. I have one final issue I wish to explore. The Scottish rate resolution requires to be agreed by the end of March, uh, and the, the this committee heard previously uh, that if the Scottish rate resolution is agreed right at the end of that period, then that could give rise to extra costs because you guys have got to change people's tax codes at the very start of the financial year. Uh, that being the case, so the, the previous committee heard there would be extra costs. Have you any idea how much those extra costs are and whose costs are those? The costs are borne by the Scottish Government. Right. Those are costs that are passed on to the Scottish Government. Um, the extra costs will depend on the nature of the change. Um, the change this year to the higher rate threshold was relatively small. It only affected a minority of tax codes. Um, a change to, say, to the basic rate later on, late on in, the, uh, in the process would affect a large number of tax codes, and therefore there would be um, a much greater cost are you um, able to give me any ballpark? Uh, I don't think I can off the top of my head, but we may be able to write and let you let you know. I think that might be useful because actually, it, it, just thinking aloud, presumably that the Scottish government has to factor that into its consideration. If we change this tax rate, there yeah. is a cost. It's a very small proportion in, in compared with the the yield from uh, the, the tax change, obviously. Uh, when. Uh, so, so the, the analysis predicates on uh, the, the Scottish rate resolution not being agreed until right up to the end of March, uh, and that could incur additional cost. So how far before the end of March would the rate resolution need to be agreed to avoid incurring that additional cost, do you think? We do an annual tax code update uh, for the whole of the UK which runs around the, the end of the year, so December, January. Um, the agreement we have at the moment with the Scottish Government in the Memorandum of Understanding is that we need, by the end of November, to have at least an, a, 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 an assumption, if you like, to use in those codes that we, op that we issue in the main coding um, exercise. We're going to have to review that, I think, because now both the potentially the UK budget and the Scottish budget are going to be later in the year, so end of November may not be a realistic assumption. Um, we certainly have been able to accommodate um, the uh, uh, Scottish budget announcement in December um, and still be able to reflect that in our main coding exercise. But if a change comes, as it did this year, um, after January, that means that we then have to do an additional exercise to redo some of those tax codes, and that's where the extra cost arises. Doesn't mean that even up to, if it was right up to the end of March, we would still do an additional tax code coding exercise. It would be up, probably be after the start of the tax year, and that would mean that employers would have to update update codes after the start of the tax year. So there's a bit of a knock-on effect there. It's all possible to do, and there are precedents for us changing 
tax codes after the start of the tax year, of course. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a whole range of things, different things that can happen. Um, uh, but, um, and, and it's always possible for us to accommodate late decisions, but there are just, uh, there's just a range of, the, of, of costs that might be available, that might be uh, incurred. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't mind at all having more uh, clarity on those costs and, and when they're incurred. Just, uh, what's in my mind is at some point the Parliament will be debating the rate resolution uh, and if there's further cost or if there is a cost implication of not getting something agreed uh, by a certain time, I think that's might be something the Parliament wants to know. You go away and look at what we can uh, come back and, and give you. Obviously, you know, as Sarah have, has explained, there's a whole range of different uh, scenarios, mm -hmm. uh, so e and each one would have to be looked at uh, individually. And so we would expect to, you know, be in close uh, liaison with the Scottish government on any particular uh, in instance or issue. So we'll see what we can give you in, in general terms, but obviously there's a quite quite a, uh, a wide range of different scenarios that each one would have to be separately impacted. Thank you. Okay. Alex Neil. Thank you. Can I, first of all, just pursue some supplementary questions on this issue of uh, who's liable to pay the Scottish rate of income tax and who isn't? Uh, and there are three particular questions. The first one is, Supposing I um, have two houses. Uh, I have a house in Scotland and I have a house in England. And I, I tell you that my main house is in England, but I've got a second house in Scotland. Would I pay the Scottish rate of income tax? It would depend on which of those uh, addresses is your main home. Uh, and we've got a set of criteria that we apply. We have, for example, identified uh, just over 2,000 cases uh, which are of the nature that you describe, where we have people with uh, where, who we know have an address in Scotland and an address in uh, elsewhere, and where they've told us that the address elsewhere is their main address, despite the Scottish address being a correspondence address for us. And we have we've actually done some compliance work to understand uh, the accuracy of what we are being told. Um, the wealthier you are, the more likely you are to have two homes, and the more likely you are to have. Um, you know, scrutiny by us, and you know, affluent and high net worth people basically are man marked by uh, uh, a relationship manager in in the UK who who tracks uh, you know their residence uh, status. But you know, I think Sarah can probably give you more details of the test that's applied. Yeah. Yes, I mean we're we're looking at things like where your children go to school, where your family is, where your where you're registered with a GP, that kind of thing. We would expect people to have a main home which that which, which has those types of character right. characteristics. So so if we che if if Scotland say introduced a fifty P rate of tax and I said to you my main home is no longer in Scotland, my main home is south of the border mm -hmm. Um, would you automatically accept that, or would you apply these tests and say, no, we don't accept that? I think, I think the... I mean, first of all, I would say that whilst this is a, a new scenario for us within the UK, it is something that we're very used to in the international context. We have lots of uh, taxpayers who tell us that they are resident uh, for tax purposes in France or whatever, but who appear to have a presence in the UK, and we're, we're very used to uh, policing that. Our approach to compliance is risk-based, so we assess what is the risk that someone is misleading us, and it is based on that risk, the level of intervention that we will take. Um, so, you know, Factors that are relevant are things like, well, what is the tax differential between Scotland and the rest of the UK? You know, for the current tax year, it's a maximum of about three hundred pounds, and our assessment is that that's a pretty low generates a pretty low risk of people, uh, you know, uh, sort of deliberately not complying as a result. But obviously, you know, if that differential grew in the future, we would have to reassess that risk, and and that is something I think that we intend to do annually uh, and share with the uh, Scottish government. In the circumstances where you that you describe, I think we would assess that the risk, you know, would have grown significantly, and therefore that is something that we would have to a risk that we would have to actively uh, police, and that's exactly the type of case where we uh, might well decide to investigate. Um, it depends on the 
uh, taxpayer and their level of income and what we know about their tax behaviours generally. So, for example, if that is a high net worth individual who we know has actively engaged in avoidance schemes in the past, for example, they are someone who you know, is, you know, we keep a close eye on. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if it's someone where we can uh, see evidence that oh, they do appear to move house, we may assess that in that particular case an intervention is not required. But we would certainly you know, be constantly reassessing it. risk all yes. the time. And the level of compliance intervention that we would expect to take, subject to discussion with the Scottish Government, would be you know, relative to the risk assessment. Can I ask, as part of the compliance, do you look at uh, people who are claiming uh, who are getting free tuition because allegedly they're staying in Scotland? I think that we'd all, uh, I think factors like that would all pour into the risk that someone would actively mis mislead us. So we would look at all the factors that might cause someone uh, to mislead us about their address, which would also have a tax consequence. And clearly, there can be a range of factors that drive people's behaviour, and it's not just the tax benefit, but the tax benefit may be part of it. But, but supposing, um, I mean, you, let's say I've got uh, a son who is 19. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm really living in England, uh, and I am the taxpayer in England, uh, but he has <coughs> is told the authorities up here he's resident in Scotland um, and he's getting free tuition and not having to pay tuition fees. Would you pick that up? I think, uh, I mean, obviously we're not directly accountable for administering that risk of sort of fraudulent uh, access to tuition fees who however is? who is we in, it will be someone in scottish government i assume in your right. department for education or whatever but but we what we do have is gateways to share data with other agencies that are investigating potential fraud so if uh, the police in scotland for example were investigating uh, fraud you know there are there are gateways to share hmrc information and we collaborate very closely with uh, other agencies on on um tackling fraud because if someone commits fraud in one area they're quite likely to commit it uh, in another including in ours so it's something that's in our interest and you would share travel. the necessary information between the scottish government enforcement officials or compliance officials and yourselves provided there is a legal gateway for us to do so we have to comply with the data protection rules and we have to comply with the rules which say we have to keep taxpayer information confidential but there is quite an extensive range of gateways for us to collaborate with other law enforcement agencies and uh, you know for example here in Scotland we've got HMRC staff embedded in Garkosh uh, and uh, you know and so they're both working on, on joint operations but also arranging to share information but we do obviously always check that we've got the right gateway if there is a a risk where there is not uh, a gateway that enables us to share information. You know, we have a you know a very good record, and our ministers have a very good record of acting quickly to create the necessary gateway. Can I ask about another scenario, which is quite a common one, not necessarily just amongst high net worth individuals? Um, I genuinely, and this this is not somebody trying to defraud the system, but just trying to where we catch the definition of a Scottish taxpayer for the purposes of income tax. Uh, I live in Scotland, uh, but I work in London. I, I go down on a Sunday evening or a Monday morning. I work in the city. I stay in London five days a week, and I come back up to Scotland on a Friday night. But I live in Scotland. For all intents and purposes, I live in Scotland. Does my employer in London deduct the Scottish rate of income tax? Yeah, so so willies, I believe, they're, uh, they're known as. Uh, and, willies? Uh, yeah, work in London, live in oh, right, Edinburgh, right, isn't okay. that right? Uh, well, I never knew that. The, uh, we I'm, glad, that to well, I'm glad I got an opportunity to explain <laughs> what I was saying then. Um, and the answer, the answer is yes. Right. So, you know, we would have that person flagged on our system as a Scottish uh, taxpayer, and the fact that they're uh, they're working for their employer in, in London would not uh, alter the fact that their, their employer would be given an S-code to operate. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. That clarifies that. Can I now go on to uh, nothing to do with fraud or people trying to avoid or evade tax? Um, but there's been a big debate in Scotland, as you probably know, about whether we should increase the 45p rate to 50p mm -hmm. and what would be the behavioural impact um, of doing that. Now, mm -hmm. I know there are many other scenarios, uh, you know, not just at the top rate, but um, at the standard rate and uh, the low rate of income tax you could paint. But for the purposes of this discussion, how much work has HMRC done 
on looking at the behavioural impact of tax changes, such as increasing the 45p rate to 50p rate in Scotland? Yeah, so we had a 50p additional rate in the UK in 2010-11. Yeah. Uh, it was only in place for one year. And in March 2012, uh, the department did publish an analysis of uh, the behavioural impact of that, and that is available for... Uh, you can you can find it online if you need if you need me to I can send you a, a link to it. Uh, obviously, it was quite a difficult analytical exercise to carry out because the rate was only in place for one year, and obviously the behavioural impact. You know, as you got a, a, a series of data, you might get better uh, understanding of what the ongoing behavioural impact was. But in broad terms, you know, the outcome of that analysis was that there was a very significant. Uh, behavioural impact in affecting the tax take in 2010-11, which we had underestimated in the forecast of the yield from uh, that 50p rate. So, for example, in particular, we saw a signif significant level of forestalling, where people who had the option brought forward income into the previous uh, tax year when the the rate was lower, and that had a consequential impact on the yield in the in the following uh, tax year. So you can look at that analysis, it, it draws what conclusions we could from having that rate in place for one for one yeah. year, but it did indicate that there was a significant behavioural uh, impact, which you would have to look at, uh, you know, how you, whether you could, whether and how you could uh, constrain that impact in the future if you were introducing higher, higher so rates. So would it be fair to say, based on your analysis, if there is a 50p rate in Scotland, you could actually end up receiving less revenue because of Potentially, because of the result of likely behavioural impacts. I'm not sure that it's safe to draw conclusions for what would happen in, in Scotland. That was a UK-wide uh, rate. Um, the, uh, and as I say, we only had very limited data because it was only in place for one year. But certainly in that instance, uh, we saw that there was a, a large behavioural impact that we had underestimated uh, at the outset. It did mean that in the one year that that rate was in place, it... it raised less revenue than had been uh, forecast for it. Uh, it says very, that analysis says very little about what the, what the ongoing uh, effect would have been because obviously we didn't have an abil any ability to test that. Yeah. And, and it wasn't a permanent rise, that, obviously, because it had been announced at some stage that it was only it was going to be abolished. But the no, I mean, it was, I, my, from recollection, it was introduced as a sort of final act of the Labour government yeah. before the coalition government came in in 2010 and uh, repealed it. Yes. Uh, so I, I, from recollection, it wasn't announced as a one-year measure, but it, 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 in practice, it was only in place for one year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but the point I'm making is, if it had been in in place longer, maybe with the behavioural impacts being greater or smaller or neutralised? I think, or? I mean, that's something that we, you know, you would, we don't have the uh, data to test, but, you know, for example, to the extent that people uh, uh, either, def you know, took income early or delayed taking it, uh, you know, th there may be a different impact over time. So people may, may, people may uh, have an ability for a period of time uh, to do that kind of thing, yeah. but after a while they may have less of an ability to uh, to do it. Um, but you know that analysis doesn't really get to that because, as I say, it only had yeah. data for one year. Have you done any more general work on behavioural impacts? Um, I mean, we we do that all the time for policy costings for our ministers, but I can't share what policies they do or do not uh, ask us to <coughs> ask us to cost. And, and is that the kind of exercise you would do for the Scottish Government if asked? I think it would be for the the Scottish Government and the Scottish Fiscal Commission to carry out that kind of right. But you work. would cooperate with it? Well, what we certainly do is uh, provide them with uh, the data sets to yeah. enable them to do policy costings and forecasts. So, for example, uh, the uh, in, in the UK, the Office of Budget Responsibility uses uh, the s sort of survey of personal incomes yep. as a key data set and you know, we have uh, essentially given the, the Scottish subset of that data uh, to Scotland so the Scottish Government and the Scottish Fiscal Commission can make their own forecasts so yep. uh, you know we don't uh, you know we haven't got an agreement to provide an analytical service but we certainly provide data. Okay thank you. I, I wonder whether I could pursue this just 
a little bit further because you're absolutely right it is the Scottish Fiscal Commission that will be providing some of the you know modeling of behavioral impacts um, to us in our budget discussions we, we've already seen forestalling I think with the land and business transaction tax which uh, you you may have noted but but I wonder in planning any tax system how much of this you can do in advance so if if the Scottish Government indicated that they were considering a 50 pence top rate of tax, whether they or the Fiscal Commission sought you to do some of the modelling in advance, you could conceivably put tax avoidance measures in place before that was brought in. Would that be correct? I think if, yeah, I think if you are a, uh, a policy maker and you know that a policy measure is in consideration that it's going to have, is likely to have a big behavioural impact, you would then look at are there measures we can put in place to manage that uh, the ability for people to have that behavioural impact? And you know there may be certain things that you could there's certain avenues that you could close off. There may be other avenues where you may feel really the options to close that off are, are more limited. So that is the kind of that is the kind of thing that you could that you could look at. So so you could effectively minimise the bulk of the impact in advance. There there I mean undoubtedly there may be some uh, behavioural choices that taxpayers might have available to them that you could close off. Uh, there may be others uh, or that you would have options to close off. Uh, there may be others that you know you would have less option to do anything uh, anything about it. Uh, you know it is in the nature of the you know people who who have got wealth and high incomes that they can plan their affairs, they can plan when, whether and when to take income, whether and when to sell an asset and realise uh, again. Uh, you know, some of those behaviours you might be able to legislate to constrain, some of them you, you might decide that you can't. Okay, that's helpful. Um, I recall having been on the Finance Committee at the time, one of your senior colleagues coming along in, in the discussion about this very subject and telling us that um, tax avoidance measures had, had improved um, over the, the course of the piece and he didn't foresee necessarily any problems um, with that. Is, is that your feel for what's going on on the ground, that this you've actually taken more there's measures? There's certainly been a, a large raft uh, of anti-avoidance measures in recent years that have significantly uh, stamped out uh, tax avoidance as an activity. It's not completely uh, stamped out and probably never will be, but we've seen a very, very significant reduction in the use of uh, tax avoidance schemes. Uh, in recent years also some caps have been put on reliefs, so uh, even though it's not tax avoidance, people might, you know, choosing to uh, you know, put their money into something that is relieved. The, you know, the, the the ability to do that in some instances is now uh, capped. So, certainly, I think some of the avenues that we would regard as mischiefs because they're tax avoidance. Yes, there's been a lot of work done to to close off the opportunities for that. I mean, a key um, area of sort of pressure in the tax system. Uh, at the moment around tax planning is what we call tax motivated incorporation where you have differential uh, tax treatment of employed person people versus self-employed versus uh, companies and we're certainly seeing a behavioral impact where people incorporate and one of the reasons why they're incorporating is to take advantage of that tax uh, differential whether you call that tax avoidance or sensible uh, legitimate steps but nevertheless it is a behavior that we that we see and uh, you know if those differentials were to increase, then there would be a greater incentive for people to, to do that. Uh, so there are still areas of tax planning that people uh, carry out where there are opportunities and they're certainly by no means all closed off. Okay. Um, one final question from me. I, I'm conscious you've had a series of kind of mergers, consolidations, call it what you will, of tax offices and, you know, Glasgow and Edinburgh have been affected. Has this had any impact on your work on Shrit? Yeah, uh, no, I mean, we, we have a, uh, a programme over the coming years of uh, reducing the number of small offices that we have and concentrating our resources into 13 regional centres plus, I think, six specialist offices and, and a head office uh, because we think that will enable us to deliver a better service uh, more efficiently. That has not been all implemented. That is in train over the next few uh, years. But, uh, no, there's been no impact from that on our... Uh, implementation of the uh, Scottish Rate of Income Tax. Okay. Any further questions from colleagues? No. In that case, can I thank our witnesses very much for appearing before the committee this morning. We'll sus suspend briefly to allow a changeover.
Okay, we'll now move to agenda item three and we'll be taking evidence relating to our post-legislative scrutiny of the National Fraud Initiative. Um, and can I welcome to the committee this morning, Derek Mackay, Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution, and Brian Taylor, Senior Risk Manager for the Scottish Government. Um, I understand the Cabinet Secretary would like to make an opening statement before we move to questions. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good news is it's a very brief uh, opening uh, statement. I appreciate the opportunity to contribute to your first piece of post-legislative uh, scrutiny and appreciate your interest in the effectiveness of the National Fraud Initiative, uh, which was just one tool that the public sector uses to combat the risk of fraud. The Scottish Government takes the prevention, detection and investigation of fraud very seriously, and as well as ensuring our key financial controls are robust, we work with all public bodies to share fraud prevention information and good practice, and this is all underpinned by effective audit arrangements. And with respect to the National Fraud Initiative, more specifically, ministers and legislation enabled Audit Scotland to carry out data matching exercises to assist in the prevention and detection of fraud in Scotland. The Cabinet Office oversee the exercise across the UK as a whole and is responsible for the effectiveness of the data matching processes. It is important to review the effectiveness of the NFI and to make improvements where possible, enabling and maximising the value of participation. If, as a result of your scrutiny, you make recommendations that would require statutory amendment, then this would be for Scottish Ministers to consider and take forward, and we will be happy to do so. Other recommendations to improve the effectiveness of the exercise may be for the Cabinet Office as owners of the data matching service or for Audit Scotland as a facilitator of the process in Scotland. But Scottish Government uh, officials will be happy to support these considerations. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I understand the Cabinet Secretary is also willing to take questions on our previous evidence session from HMRC, but if we could hold those back um, and start perhaps with the National Fraud Initiative, Colin Beattie. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, uh, in the last evidence session we had on NFI, I was quite interested to discover that there was the possibility of having real-time pre-transaction checking, which I had no idea was, was actually available. Now, clearly, there must be advantages in that. The NFI is, I think, if I remember correctly, a three-yearly exercise, a big exercise in itself. Surely, uh, this real-time checking has a, has a huge advantage in eliminating fraud that could otherwise be ongoing for a lengthy period. Now, I understand, if I remember correctly, the cost is less than £2,000 for each local authority, let's say. Now, there's, there's one thing arising from that, of course, is that... Uh, Part of the benefit would be for the DWP, but part would also be for the councils. Is there a way that this could be introduced, sponsored by the Scottish Government? Um, well, at the moment, we support Audit Scotland, <clears throat> as well as the local authorities, through the general financing. Um, so it is up to those organisations to contribute financially. If you, know, if you have further recommendations around the financing of it, I'd be interested in that. But um, I think that's an operational matter which uh, we could consider. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the the app checker uh, and its its use, it's got some restrictions to it in terms of the data in it. Some of it's quite old. Um, some of it is refreshed every two months, so some of it's quite valuable. Um, the cabinet office themselves have um, used uh, the app checker um, to try and encourage people. Uh, in other words, to, they've promoted it. Um, so they've given it at reduced rates. So if we were going to try and rule something out across Scotland, and we'd want to talk to them first about how best to do it, and cost would be part of that. So hopefully we could overcome any, any barrier. We've, we, we've already had initial arrangements with them about coming um, to Scotland and helping to roll out the app checker, as it's quite, quite new. Um, so we'd be absolutely uh, willing to, to, to talk to them about how, how best to do it. It's something that we would consider in terms of central funding. So are we saying this is actually in course at the moment? Discussions are underway on this? Yes. When do you expect that to be completed? Um, it's part of the NFI steering group discussions. Um, we had our last uh, meeting in October. Um, and the next meeting is yet to be scheduled, but on the back of, of uh, these hearings, we've been in touch with the Cabinet Office. So they're, they're scheduling, but I couldn't tell you when the next one will be. Now, one of the things that uh, arose again in the last evidence session is that uh, there are significant areas that are excluded from the NFI, such as housing associations. Are there any thoughts about bringing them on board as well? Whether that needs legislation or other encouragement, I don't know. 
Um, again, I am uh, interested in uh, considering that, if you think it's required, but there is the ability to have current data matching powers. It does allow voluntary participation, uh, but if there's a sense that there should be compulsion, uh, then you know, I'm interested uh, in that. And there's a range of measures that can be used in terms of uh, preventing uh, fraud and there's work from the, re the regulator and others. Um, but, but they can participate in it already, but there's an issue around uh, compulsion if you felt that that was required. I think, I think the difficulty the that this committee's picked up is that uh, there seems to be a significant number of housing associations that simply don't, almost by default, participate, which leads us to look at the, whether they should be compelled to, mm -hmm. given the fact that uh, they're such a significant part mm -hmm. of the opportunity to eliminate yeah. fraud. So there hasn't been, sorry, can be done, uh, there hasn't been um, a evidence that this is uh, required uh, in terms of fraud identified that, that they would uh, necessitate this, but as I say, if the committee is uh, willing to produce that as a recommendation, I'll look at it, uh, in terms of compulsion. Uh, but there are, of course, other checks and balances in place. The, the other thing is that current legislation doesn't actually allow for enforcing follow-ups from NFI. Uh, now, some of the councils that appeared in front of us did make the point that, in, that they, have the, they take the discretion in certain cases where the amount involved is so trivial it would cost more to follow up on this particular line of investigation, they just drop it. Would you think that there could be a benefit in bringing in legislation to enforce follow-ups while still giving a little bit of wriggle room for councils? I mean, op operationally, it'd be for the organisation to take forward and the, and, and the audit agencies as well. Um, you know, that'd be the, were they a further consideration? I mean, okay. so, sorry, just, just, just to add, uh, in terms of Dane Saith, um, the uh, Cabinet Office do work on an encouragement basis, and I think that's Audit Scotland's approach to um, trying to get people properly engaged in it rather than taking away the organisational flexibility and the resource requirements that might be required if it was enforced. Okay. Alex Neal. Two questions. Uh, first of all, on the National Fraud Initiative, uh, from the evidence we've taken so far, it would appear that the National Fraud Initiative has been quite effective in reducing incidences of fraud. Um, you can always go further, there's always more to do, and as Colin says, maybe there's a need to look at uh, compelling organisations like housing associations to participate. But given the success of it, is the time come to look at what possibly widening the remit? Let me give you an example. Um, tuition fees, uh, which takes up a very large amount of money in Scotland, quite rightly, every year. But clearly we have people resident in Scotland uh, qualify for getting their tuition fees paid, people living in the rest of the UK don't, people living in the EU do, uh, although some of that will change policy-wise after Brexit. But the, the fundamental point is, um, it, Picking that as an example, has the case come to look at where the National Fraud Initiative could be employed and have an extended remit uh, to weed out fraud in other areas such as tuition fees, if indeed there is fraud, but we don't know. I think it's a very helpful point uh, from Mr. Lee. It's very hard to, to quantify the preventative effect of this initiative, indeed other initiatives. You can't quantify what, what fraud hasn't happened because of these kind of uh, measures and and just looking at the impact on, on the Scottish Government so far, the very small amount that was uh, alerted that has risk and investigated uh, and uh, resolved. Uh, we could respond whether demands around uh, risk or the, the potential uh, threat. Um, a huge issue coming our way, of course, is going to be Social Security. So I think it will require careful consideration of where the data with Social Security uh, can play into this as well. So I think it's right to look at risk and areas of risk and then see what, what, what's uh, appropriate. That specific example hasn't come up uh, as an issue, identified to as, as an issue, but again worthy of consideration in terms of uh, the remit and scope uh, of this exercise, but maybe Brian can say more around that risk analysis. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the thing to add is about any extension of scope, and you're absolutely right that it should be considered, is that it's, it's not just about adding more and more data. It's mm. about adding data that's going to bring about good value, high-risk matches that are going to be of use to um, the organisations that participate. 
Um, so you're right in terms of it should always be reviewed about what extra data sets should be brought on board, you know, particularly things like social security. Um, and something about tuition fees has, has, has not come up, but it, but it may well be something that could be included. Just that we, we seem to be always chasing and spending a lot of resources in chasing people at the lower end of the income scale who rely particularly on social security benefits. And I'm not justifying fraud. Fraud should be weeded out no matter where it is. But, you know, we criticise quite rightly the UK government for spending something like four or five times as much on identifying and dealing with fraud among Social Security alleged benefit fraudsters. But uh, it's four times as much spent on that as there is on uh, tackling tax fraudsters and tax avoiders and evaders. Uh, and maybe we are in danger of making the same mistake. Maybe some of these, if you like, benefits uh, to that tend to benefit more middle class people, better off people. Maybe we should be looking uh, to see, to be, to, be insure, to be sure that there isn't any fraud of any scale on these programmes as well. I'm not suggesting there is, and uh, but and nevertheless, I would have thought, given the amount of money we're now spending, and it's not just tuition fees, there are many other programmes as well where we're dishing out a lot of public money to people, surely we should be taking as robust an approach to those people as we are to people in lower incomes. I, I think you, you raise an important point there in that it needs to be risk-based, but it also needs to be proportionate. Absolutely. Perhaps. But my point is, is it not time to look at proportionately whether we need to extend the remit to cover some of these other programmes? In the consideration of extension, yeah, proportionality should absolutely be a factor, yes. Right, OK. Uh, two, two questions arising from the previous evidence session this morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, first of all, um, one of the things that's very clear about Scottish rate of income tax, uh, or any rate of income tax, is that um, the level of allowances and reliefs is an important element of deciding the tax take and, indeed, the economic and behavioural impacts of any level of taxation. Can I ask if the Scottish Government is pressing the UK Government uh, to extend our powers over income tax to cover all aspects of income tax, including reliefs and allowances, which would give us much more power to be innovative in the application of in income tax policy north of the border? This is a substantial reach from the evidence session this morning, but I'll but allow the Cabinet <laughs> Secretary to answer. <laughs> Convener, it would be unlike uh, both you and Mr Neil to want to spring any surprises on me <laughs> coming from earlier evidence. I'm uh, sure you're fast enough on your feet to deal with it. Yes, well that bought me a few seconds to think about how to answer <laughs> it. Uh, no, I mean the, the simple answer is yes, of course we take a maximalist position in the Scottish Government in terms of the devolution of powers and the functions uh, uh, within and we, we have uh, repeatedly made the point around uh, revenue de generation um, issues around tax avoidance and so on, that of course if we had more levers, uh, more opportunities to tackle that, then, then we would welcome that. So we have made the point, and I've certainly made it with uh, Treasury Ministers. Yeah. Maybe we need to step that up a wee bit, do we? Yes, I mean, I think it's fair to say that on income tax, we, uh, and of course we'll have a, an opportunity with a new UK government to set out... Uh, immediate asks, uh, but it would be a continuation of our argument around uh, tax collection uh, in Scotland and the decision we can take and address some of the anomalies that, that now exist uh, because of uh, the just partial control around income tax for the reasons that you've given. Yeah. Uh, if the committee wishes to collectively add to that, then I would certainly welcome that intervention. Good, thank you. And the second question arising from this morning's evidence is... Um, in relation to the debate about the behavioural impact of any tax changes, obviously that debate has been around whether you increase the top rate from 45p to 50p. Um, and obviously the HMRC, if you were listening to their evidence earlier, which uh, you may have may not have been, uh, mentioned their analysis of the one year when there was a 50p tax rate in recent times, um, in 2010-2011. And clearly the analysis they did showed that there was a substantial behavioural impact for the duration of that extra 5p uh, on the rate of top rate of income tax. What work has the Scottish Government commissioned to look at behavioural impacts of any rate changes, in particular whether the top rate should be raised from 45 to 50p? So without getting into the political argument eh, on that and the Scottish Government's position 
on uh, Scotland only change compared to uh, UK wide change. We've commissioned the Council of Economic Advisors to look at this issue and to report back in good time for the budget process because clearly it would be a budget consideration for the government and therefore the parliament. Uh, so to consider all of those issues and report back. So it's the Council of Economic Advisors that the First Minister has requested a uh, look at this issue. And will the report be published? I haven't been asked that before. Um, so in anticipating uh, that question, first of all, it will advise uh, ministers uh, and um, I, I would want to double check this, but I think the evidence was published last time around, so I would try and stick with the precedent to do that. Uh, whilst keeping within the um, parameters of, of guidance and advice to ministers, um, I, I, would be, I would be happy to share the, yeah. uh, the position. I, I'm, the I'm not suggesting it be published before the budget, but exactly. presumably it be published with the budget. Yeah, I'm not sure from uh, last time uh, round the analysis uh, when it was published, but you know, in the interest of transparency, I'd want to do that, with, although uh, keeping within the protocols of advice to, uh, to ministers, but you know, I think people would want to see that evidence, would they not? Yeah. And can I ask, is the remit to the Council of Economic uh, Advisors uh, limited to looking at the behavioural impact of increasing the 45p rate or is it a wider piece of work looking at any variation in the lower rates? No, it was specifically to look at the additional rate. Right, okay, thank you. Okay, if we could perhaps stick to the National Fraud Initiative <laughs> first and then we'll come back to, to, but you see once Alex gets going it's very difficult to stop him. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, so I'm interested in the cost-benefit of the National Fraud Initiative. Uh, so just a number of questions during that. Uh, we heard in a previous committee session about there being diminishing returns, diminishing financial returns on, from the NFI, uh, and various witnesses expressed their views about that. Do you have a view on the diminishing financial returns on the NFI? I suppose to answer that question, I would take you back to my point around it's difficult to quantify the preventative element of this, you know, what we've prevented in terms of, of fraud not happening and uh, uh, discouraging it. Um, if you take just what we have uh, been able to run through the system and identify as an issue for Scottish Government, it goes from a substantial figure of over a, a billion pounds worth of transactions put through the system down to identifying payment of just over £10,000, and then addressing that and successfully recovering it. So, put in context, um, that's our figures. Uh, so, I still believe it's a very worthwhile exercise. I don't want to overstate our role within it uh, as the legislative enablers of it, participants in it, uh, but I think we all see a value in its continuation, hence the discussion around extension of its scope. Uh, but it, it appears to continue to be worthwhile. Uh, do you think that there is any way to quantify the deterrent effect? Uh, because the, the, the witness is very clear, they give a similar answer, uh, and said, look, th there is this whole deterrent going on, uh, and I suspect that's true, but th there must be some way to uh, at least go some way to quantifying that deterrent effect, and if so, it then begs a question about whether resource should be spent on a more proactive and comprehensive kind of marketing campaign uh, to increase the deterrent value, do you think? It feels like more, a, more an operational issue for Audit Scotland and other um, agencies. I think we'd be more concerned if we uh, removed the function, removed the initiative. Um, now, of course, there's many other tools in place to tackle fraud. Uh, but my sense if it was removed, it would probably cause more concern uh, than trying to promote it. But yes, there are other public agencies that could, could play into it and, and more data that could be considered. Brian, can you maybe say more then about uh, risk uh, and, and how you see it playing within that? Would that be helpful? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, the, the, the other point um, around uh, being part of the NFIs, it does give good assurance on the financial systems. So having our data run through it and having the small returns does give us assurance that our controls are working well. So there's that aspect to it as well. Uh, it com confirms uh, how well they're working. There's the de deterrent factor as mentioned. I think the difficulty in measuring it is 
um, as has been undertaken in the past with things like the uh, annual fraud indicator. Uh, an awful lot of it is based on estimates, estimates of fraud. So you could do crude comparisons of a de deterrent and, and, and look at the fraud identified against the kind of uh, average figures that you would find in organisations that vary between 5 and 10%. So you could do that. Um, I think the answer really is trying to continue to improve the value of the transactions so that we get more results for less matches, uh, wherever that's possible, and at the same time do the kind of promotion work that you're talking about, because I think that's important as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and moving on from that, Cabinet Secretary, you said in your opening remarks that uh, we need to maximise participation, I think were the words you used. Uh, and one way that we explored in the previous session was if the public were able to see outcomes. So if there was some way uh, whereby uh, the public can see, when, when they flag an issue, what actually happens as a result of that. I'll throw this in as a question, but do you think that uh, within the current data protection restrictions that we have, that is something that could be considered? It could be considered. I suppose anything could be uh, considered. Uh, there will be parameters that we have to work uh, uh, within, um, so we could look further at that. But of course, each organisation and Audit Scotland, who facilitate this, and Cabinet Office, who oversee it, could ultimately produce reports around how they uh, uh, believe it to be working. So it could be considered. Do we do we really, at the same time, want to produce a report every time there's a complaint, and then action, and then an understanding? Because I say this is one of many tools in terms of tackling uh, fraud. So um, it could be considered, but uh, I'm not sure uh, the value of publishing too much, uh, bearing in mind, as you say quite rightly, uh, the difficulties around data protection. Mm -hmm. uh, and just finally, uh, the just uh, to, to pull together the whole cost-benefit piece, uh, so for example, Murray Council in their evidence talked about uh, 2,800 matches, of which there were 20 positive outcomes. Uh, now, the cost of those outcomes, the cost of getting to that point, is borne by, presumably, the local council or a Scottish agency, if I can put it that way. But the benefit accrues to the Department of Work and Pensions in, in this particular example. Do you have a view of that? And is that something that we should be looking to review as part of the NFI? I don't have a strong view. It's in the public interest that the public sector all works together to identify um, a, a fraud, uh, to tackle value for money, so on and so forth. And if you look at the figure I was able to give you of Scottish Government transactions, you know, what we were able to, to, to look at, you know, there's still value and reassurance around our systems and identifying what might not be fraud, but duplication in uh, address that. So I do believe there's value to the public purse, irrespective of who's contributing to it. Thank you. Okay. Monica Lennon. Thanks, Convener. Good morning. Um, we heard in oral evidence from, from a number of local authorities, and one of the things that surprised me, I guess, is that the way the exercises are set up, they're very much standalone exercises, so there doesn't appear to be a way to to track and identify repeat offenders. Now, Jim Hara from HMRC this morning said in his evidence that if a person commits fraud in one area, they're likely to commit fraud in another. Um, do you recognise the, the limitations in the current system with the, the current statutory powers and, and Cabinet Secretary, do you think this, this could be addressed through legislative change? Um, in terms of uh, repeat offender, uh, I think this has been identified as an issue. Where's the that? Yeah. I think it has been identified uh, as an issue. Cabinet Office are working on it, um, and I would be interested in their conclusions, as I say. They're the uh, lead organisation across the UK, and you know, if we require legislative change, again, I'm open to that in terms of presenting that. Uh, if that is what is required, but Cabinet Office are leading that piece of work. Yeah, I think it's just what struck me, certainly from the evidence that 
we've got a sort of really static picture, obviously a, a retrospective nature and looking back at these mm -hmm. data matches, but um, if there's good intelligence there, it seems that there could be a missed opportunity if people are not proactively you know, using that information. Yeah. As I say, I'm happy to consider this based on your recommendations and what the Cabinet Office conclude. Okay. The other thing that, that came out of the the evidence from from the local authority officers who are very much, you know, at the coal face of this is that, you know, by looking at this the sheer, you know, volume of data matches and all the other um sources of intelligence that they get, that they appear to be absolutely drowning in data and it very much is about taking a risk based approach and really trying to prioritise. But when you hear about the, the number of matches and data, um, is it your concern that there's not enough resource in the system to really properly, you know, drill down into all that data and, and try and um, detect frauds? Um. Again, uh, the, so we're looking at our specific role within the NFI, which is as a legal enabler and a participant in. Um, it hasn't been identified to me that there is a resource issue in following up work or <coughs> engaging uh, within it. Um, but as I say, there are a range of ways that uh, public sector organisations uh, deal with uh, the issue. But uh, if you've got further evidence around resource, then I'm interested uh, yeah. in hearing that. But, but bearing in mind, of course, how the audit agencies do their job and the public sector organisations do their job and how we fit in with that in terms of yeah. Cabinet Office, Audit Scotland, and us as a legal enabler. Mm -hmm. Just from the, the evidence that we heard, um, it looks like within local authorities there's, there's very small teams who are dedicated to, to this work and there's also some concerns that there can be delays with other public bodies you know, providing information, so it's maybe worth a closer look. Liam Kerr touched on the, the data protection aspect of this. Um, one of the the concerns, I think it was the officer from Aberdeen City Council, he had raised that the public do get frustrated um, when they provide information and, and no one can get back to them. And partly, again, it's about the volume of work in the system, but also about data protection. Now, we understand that data protection laws are, are in place for, for very good reasons to protect people's privacy. But again, it seems like there's very little awareness of the National Fraud Initiative. So if we can without generating lots of reports and lots of paperwork, but can you foresee ways, I know you've worked in local government too, um, as, a, as a councillor, so can you see simple ways that, that the public can be kept informed and at least they'll feel encouraged to, to cooperate? So I think on the two points, so in terms of resource for each organisation, <coughs> that is a matter for them in referencing uh, uh, local authorities specifically. The size of their internal audit or their audit function and facility is a matter for them. Um, so it's not as if there, there's, a, there's a, a kind of central um, coordination of that resource. That is for each uh, organisation. Of course, there's specific uh, funding arrangements for Audit Scotland as well. So that resource matter uh, is... Uh, for them. But yes, I am interested in any recommendations around awareness of um, this initiative. Um, but again, I'm respecting the Scottish Government's role within it as well. We're a legal enabler of and a participant in. Uh, if there are re any recommendations, I we, they and uh, we as a partner uh, promote it to the public, um, so be it. Without raising any unnecessary alarm at the same time as well, um, but also to as, as, as you've described, give appropriate and proportionate feedback without creating new bureaucracy and protecting people's position in terms of data protection. Thank you. Just one last question, which is perhaps more directly aimed at Scottish Government. I'm just interested to know what work the Government is doing to ensure that the, no, the new social security powers will fit well with the National Fraud Initiative. I can go into some more detail in terms of the forward planning, but I suppose it was the point I just touched upon earlier, that when you look at the scale of data, number of transactions, uh, people involved, then it would be part of our um, risk analysis. And in essence, knowing that the government, through, through our agency, will be doing more transactions you know, in a week than we currently do in a year as a consequence of the um, social security powers and, and functions. So planning how that, that may play in, in future whilst... Um, working that into the programme over the next few years. Again, Brian might be able to say a bit more operationally about that. Yeah, it's it's just important for the committee to, to be aware that the Social Security Agency, in, uh, 
in its formation has counter fraud as a key aspect of, of, of its programme of work. Um, so it will have comprehensive data matching um, built into that. That will be um, consideration of the NFI, but it will go beyond that as well in terms of what data matching is required to, to make sure it counters fraud effectively. Brian, I wonder if you can maybe say something about the anticipated costs then, because as the Cabinet Secretary said, you know, it's going to be a huge, you know, uh, additional volume. So have you got any figures on, on the, the costs Do of NFI in the terms of the, the Social Security powers? Well, the, there shouldn't be... I, I would need to talk to um, Cabinet Office and Audit Scotland to see if there's any uh, significant cost implications. Okay. Um, fr from what I'm aware of, uh, it shouldn't because the, the, the data pool, because it's vast as it is with 300 million um, pieces of data, I, I don't think it would be significantly affected, but I would need to, okay. to check it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. I wonder if I could just uh, stick with this issue about the repeat um, offenders. <laughs> Cabinet Secretary, I raised this a couple of weeks ago. And I think I was surprised, maybe like colleagues around the table, to, to learn that they don't automatically investigate um, frauds in the second year if they were perpetrated in the first year. It's all down to the data set that's presented for analysis. And I think I was quite surprised at that. that if we, <coughs> someone had tried to commit a fraud in year one, then why don't we check them in year two? Are we permitted to do that? I presume we are. So we don't need legislation to do that, I don't think, could you? Try and clarify that. Um, there, there are some restrictions on what can be done uh, in terms of profiling. Um, I, I, I'm not an expert on that, um, but there are restrictions on what can and can't be done. Um, I think the uh, important point, and it's been raised already in the discussions that we've had, will be the extension of um, UK legislation that will allow the sharing of uh, information with third parties, which would include credit reference agencies, um, as well as uh, agencies that would have information on known fraudsters. Um, so that way we would be getting to the, the kind of repeat offending issue that you're, you're talking about and we'd be able to check the data against that. Um, that um, I'm, I'm not aware of the exact details of rollout, but I could get that information and, and feed it back to the committee. Yeah. yeah. But, but just be fair, we're waiting for the conclusion of the Cabinet Office work on this. Yes, who were doing, yeah, we doing a pilot exercise. Okay, that, that's really helpful. Um, some of the councils also said that there was there's no legal gateway for them to request information from HMRC to help with the National Fraud Initiative and Detection. There was quite a number of them, in fact, said that they would, they would like that to happen. What would be the mechanism for, for us to achieve that? Would we have to get agreement from HMRC? Could, can we compel it? Can we require it? Or how would it work if, if we wanted to do that? Um, the... The, yeah, the, the, the restrictions would be around the, the fair and, and lawful use of the, use of the data. Uh, in terms of HMRC itself, what we would do is work with Cabinet Office. They already do a great deal of work um, with HMRC and DWP in matching data. Um, and including more HMRC data from the NFI exercise would be something we'd have to work with uh, um, Audit Scotland and the Cabinet Office with. And, and I suppose from those discussions we'd find out whether or not any actual additional legislation would be required or whether it could simply be done um, through you know, more effective communication and, and, and engagement. Mm. I, think, I think it was um, more a case that there just was no legal mechanism for us to get information for the councils to get information should they think they needed it. Even if they made the request, it, was, it wasn't forthcoming because there's no legal framework for it. But they all said it would be very helpful and it would add to the initiative's success rate, we think, Cabinet Secretary, if that were the, the model that we used. Yes, uh, and I think the same would be true around the legal gateway issue. Um, would be uh, engaging with uh, Cabinet Office through them and HMRC to, to make sure, I, I mean, I'm not aware of, of the actual barriers that have been highlighted. So we'd absolutely want to understand what, what those were and what would be required to get over it, whether it would be um, just a, a disagreement on the legal position or whether actually further legislation would be required. Okay. Um, on, on data protection... Can I, can I just sorry? be clear on that? I mean, that, that's our willingness to be open if this is identified as an issue between local authorities in HMRC and it requires a legal remedy, then we are open to that to help enable that if that is indeed the issue but there does seem to be a dispute on whether it is legal issue or around implementation but okay based on your evidence right on wider data protection issues you'll you'll be aware that the european union regulation on data protection comes into force next may 
which makes which introduces even more stringent arrangements for data sharing and data security. My understanding is that, is that the UK government is signing up to that regulation, whether or not it leaves the European Union, it's signing up to it. Do you think the, tight, the tightening of data security will make it harder for us to detect fraud across a range of agencies that have been mentioned today, you know, between tax and benefits and social security? Do you think it will make it harder when the regulation comes into force to do that? I, I, I'm not aware of the, the, the full implications um, that, that those new arrangements would bring. Um, I, certainly the controls that we have around the data protection and its use are very stringent just now. Um, so, I, again, I wouldn't expect those to be significant. But in terms of a detailed response, I, we'd, we'd have to have a further look into it and, and, and report back to you. Okay. Hey, last question, convener. It was in relation to this morning's uh, business. In terms of accuracy of the data that HMRC actually have on that particular issue on Scottish rate of income tax, are you assured in what form does the assurance take from HMRC to the Scottish Government that we have correct and accurate data that we enables us to identify Scottish taxpayers? Well, I'm pretty sure Mr Coffey's asked me this question on the Finance Committee as well. <laughs> uh, so we, we have a range uh, of assurances. There's, there's a political level agreement, there's arrangements around uh, the fiscal framework and its implementation, and then essentially um, the, the officials' engagement. And there was that earlier issue identified where not all uh, Scottish rate uh, income tax uh, payers were identified, but have been identified. And say they, they're doing their various checks that they can answer for as to assuring us as a uh, Scottish Government, indeed the Parliament, that they've identified uh, everyone that should be paying tax uh, in Scotland. So I think I'm as, as assured as I can be, based on all the information that I have, that they've undertaken the range of exercises to identify everyone. And um, uh, there's been some further exercises to, to, to uh, ensure that that is the, the case. But yes, there was a substantial amount of people identified uh, further on in the, in the system. It didn't cost any money. It uh, didn't uh, uh, lead to us losing any revenue. Uh, but uh, yes, I'm as assured as I can be. And if I wasn't, I'd be raising it with the Secretary of State and the uh, Chancellor and uh, other ministers as well. But there's ongoing work with officials. OK. Thank you. OK. The Clearly, the temptation of committee members to move over to the evidence session this morning couldn't be contained, but, <laughs> but we'd reached the end of those that had indicated they wanted to ask questions on the National Fraud Initiative. So now I will properly move over to the evidence we heard from HMRC this morning. Is there anybody who would like to come in at this point? Monica Lennon. If I, because oh. I'm <laughs> such a fan of the National Fraud I give up. Initiative. You can be our champion. Yeah, and apologies if it was asked earlier on. I know there was some discussion about, you know, sort of voluntary participation. Um, but, Cabinet Secretary, is it your view that all bodies that are spending public money should participate? And should that include, or should that be a condition of procurement bids for public projects? I'm not quite sure. I don't, I don't think just making it compulsory for, for everything and everyone is potentially answered in terms of procurement because all organisations will have uh, policies uh, in terms of fraud and, and procurement and, and comply with the Scottish Public Finance Manual as well. So there's a range of checks and balances in place. So I'm not sure that you know compulsion for everyone for this data matching exercise, it should be compulsory and essential. It should be proportionate. Okay. Thank you. I'll let go of NFI and Are you sure move now? back to you. This community. is your last <laughs> chance. <laughs> and can, can I just to round off the MFI bit? Uh, M MFI. <laughs> Dear me, it's clearly been a long day. Um, I, I very much welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has been so open um, to the committee's recommendations even before we've made them. Um, so that's a very refreshing approach and I commend it to, to other ministers, but, but we will indeed produce a report in due course on that, and I look forward to receiving the, the bits and pieces of information that you've said you'll provide to the committee. Um, to this morning's evidence session on HMRC, are there any further questions on that? 
I wonder whether I might ask just a couple then. Um, we, we had some interesting discussions about liability for errors made, and obviously you've just said in relation to identifying the 420,000 taxpayer, Scottish taxpayers late, there was no cost to the government and actually no impact on, on the ultimate tax, tax take. Okay. Um, so I'm curious to know, if there should be an error in the future, what is your understanding of how that would play out with HMRC, particularly in the case if it was their error? Uh, I would want to come back to the committee on the specific issue of administrative error or identification error, because of course the very detailed and complex arrangements around the block grant adjustment and reconciliation of tax collected from forecast, BGA mm -hmm. and actual outturn which is quite different from administrative error mm -hmm. um, where there is fault because, of course, we are, we're paying for a function and we want that to be, to be exercised. So let me, in writing, respond on the very specific question of administrative error by our delivery agent and who pays uh, the consequential impact. Okay, that would be very helpful. Um, I have a second set of questions uh, really around the, the, the issues Alex Neil touched on because very welcome if, if you're able to do so, publication of the Council of Economic Advisers work on looking at behavioural impacts. Um, Scottish Fiscal Commission will of course be charged with doing all of this, won't they? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, In terms it, and, of forecast, yes. Yeah, yes. and the, there was, it's true to say there was no consideration of behavioural impacts in relation to the land and building transaction tax, where we've seen a lot of forestalling? In terms of its first implementation and yes. creation, so yes. that was before my uh, time, so I would need to double check uh, what uh, was provided to Mr Swinney at the time. Um, that there, there, you know, there may have been... Uh, well, uh, may maybe I could help you. As a member of the Finance Committee at the time, there was no behavioural impact assessment done, um, and this was pointed out by the Fiscal Commission at that point, and we've subsequently seen quite substantial forestalling. Um, the, the, the point I want to make, though, is that HMRC said that they could, in advance of the implementation of a tax, if they knew about it coming, actually work proactively to stop unintended consequences and put in anti-tax avoidance measures, um, for want of a better phrase. Is that something you would want to see as a result of the studies that the Fiscal Commission will do on behavioural impacts and behavioural changes? Yes. Okay. So you could anticipate you know, taking out a lot of the potential difficulties by being proactive and putting tax avoidance measures in place in advance? Yes. One of the issues that the Council of Economic Advisers has been asked to look at is, is there any way of mitigating uh, those issues to be able to change the tax position? So yes, looking at mitigation measures is part of that consideration. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Any questions from any other members of the committee? No, in that case, I thank very much the Cabinet Secretary and Mr Taylor for coming along to give evidence this morning, and could I move the committee into private session?